I was thinking of preaching about harvest this week, and then I saw the lectionary reading, and it was about divorce. And I thought, <laughs> thanks a bunch, honestly. <laughs> so we'll see how we go. <laughs> now, um, there was a song um, that went around in my childhood. Some of you might recognise it, some of you might not, but I think it was in the charts when I was probably kind of like young, 10 or 11 or something like that. And it was called, I've Got the Power. Anybody recognise it? Yeah. I've Got the Power. And it went, it, kind of, it went something like this, I apologise, okay, to the choir especially. I've got the power, duh, 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 duh. I've got the power. Brilliant. There we go. You might put, my choir might want to put that on your repertoire, I don't know, you might, you might not. <laughs> I've got the power, and I think what's really crucial to understand today's gospel reading, and I think it's really crucial to understand the world we live in, is to understand that word power and what it means. I think power is still an incredible and important force in the world. Whoever's got power and influence can do a lot in this world, have a lot of influence. And whoever has power has a lot of influence over how we live our lives today. So if you want to see an example of, of how power is so important, look at the situation in Afghanistan. We've seen recently the withdrawal of American and British troops from Afghanistan and the Taliban retake power. And what does that power mean for the women of Afghanistan? Well, over the past 10, 20 years or so, women have been able to do things which they haven't been able to do in Afghanistan for a very long time. Go to university, have a degree, get an education, have political status, be a judge in a court of law. But now that the Taliban have taken power, all those things have been stripped away. The Taliban do not think that it's women's place to have any of those roles or positions. The role of women is at the home and often covered up. That's what power can do. And that's a stark example to us of how when sometimes power is lost and regained, people stand to lose everything. And it's a simple fact, and I think it's really important to think of the ways in which there is still huge inequality against women throughout the world, in different cultures to our own, but also in our society today. It's much more difficult for women to succeed, to have status. And why is it so much difficult for women to succeed and have status? Well, it's because power, power is dominated by men. And it's often men who make the decisions about what women can do. And that was, of course, the situation in Jesus' time, in the culture that he lived in, a very misogynistic culture where men dominated the home and men got to make decisions. And so in the gospel reading we have, we have the Pharisees, these kind of legalistic religious people coming to Jesus and often ask, asking him tricky questions about the law. And they're trying to, to catch him out. They're trying to show him as a fraud. They're trying to see, well, is he really a follower of the law? Or is he a trickster come to con us? And they ask him about what he thinks about a man divorcing his wife. Now, I think we can still think of this, this, this today. We can think of marriage as a fairly legal thing. 
And I think throughout its history, marriage has been seen that as a social contract, as a way of families joining up. Of, and, and it's often been a situation in marriage that, again, women have been the victims, that they don't have equality. They don't have to write them to make their own decisions. It was often a very much a contract between families with women having no decision-making power whatsoever. And that was the case in Jesus' time. And it was the case, and I think it's still the case in so many cultures, that when a man wanted to divorce his wife, wanted to get rid of her, there were mechanisms for him to do that, that were abusive and wrong, leading the women on their own and in difficult circumstances. And Jesus knew that. And so Jesus' response to the Pharisees is to kind of state what was in the law all of long about men and women perhaps not being able to commit adultery and divorcing themselves. But what he is doing, he is redefining marriage in the eyes of God. In the eyes of God, in that description of Genesis, which, which, which we've read this morning, the image of marriage is of a partnership between man and woman. A partnership where they became one flesh. A partnership of love and trust and yes, often forgiveness. And it was a partnership not just with two people, but with a third, with God himself. Now I think Jesus, and I think you often see this in his Gospels, is gradually challenging, in sometimes very subtle ways, the culture of his day, about how they treated women. He's often seen talking to women, <coughs> sometimes talking to women on their own, which I think would have been still scandalous for a single man to have done that. Talking to women who were deemed prostitutes and kind of like the people who you just avoided. Jesus challenges the system. He challenges the way that we see women. And he puts women alongside men because he knows that that is the image of God's creation. That is what God has created for man and women to be equal and for marriage to be made in the image of God. Jesus is subverting the power of his day. He's turning it upside down as he does so many times. Jesus is saying, in my kingdom, you, and it's often the men, you are no longer in charge. But in God's kingdom, there is a kingdom of justice and equality and love, where God is in charge, not the dominant male-dominated society that we see all around the world. And I think, you know, as I said, power is so important in the way that it works throughout our society and influences us. And of course, it works in the way that food is distributed across the world. The fact that we have so many people who live with so little and so many, well, few people who hoard money and wealth and power to themselves. A society where often children and families can go hungry while there is an excess of wealth and consumerism elsewhere. And that's why we as a church, we are prophets and activists in the world, spotting where there is injustice, spotting where there is need. We don't really need to live in a world where anyone goes without 
the basic things they need like food and water and shelter. We want to live in a world, God's kingdom, where everyone is treated equally, no matter whether you are a woman or a man, whether you are black and ethnic minority. That is God's vision for his kingdom. That is Jesus as God's reflected glory. And so when we come to celebrate the harvest, we give thanks for all that God has given us, the beautiful food, his creation, the things we take for granted. But we're reminded about in our world where power lies. We're reminded of the fact that still huge swathes of this planet, people live in hunger and starvation. We're reminded that in huge swathes of our planet, people live under unjust regimes who hoard power to themselves and do not distribute food fairly. And as a church, we pray fervently and passionately for God's justice to prevail. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>